when the first shots were fired, Europe led the way in everything. In 1945, when the guns fell silent, the world was bankrupt and exhausted. Across three decades in which empires crumbled, new players with new ideologies emerged. A world centuries in the making had been dismantled by a world war. On the 7th of December, 1941, Japanese carrier-based aircraft attacked the American fleet at anchor in Pearl Harbor. Three days later, with his own troops at the gates of Moscow, Hitler declared war on the USA. For Hitler, the United States was a nation to be envied in some ways, for its size, for its power, its resources. There were millions of German immigrants and their descendants in the United States. But the United States was also a threat, a threat to be contained and ultimately in the long term for Hitler, a threat to be vanquished. It was truly astounding when Hitler declared war on us, recalled John Kenneth Galbraith, American economist and diplomat. It was a totally irrational thing for him to do, and I think it saved Europe. The First World War fought at least in part to preserve old empires had brought about their destruction. As 1941 dawned, the entire map of Eurasia, from the Rhine to the Volga, and from Manchuria to the Marshall Islands, had been redrawn. New empires dominated, and Adolf Hitler had got what he came for. His realm, his living space, or Lebensraum in the east, stretched from Moscow to the Atlantic coast and he ruled over a population greater than that of the United States. But it was coming at a cost. The battles that would shape the course of the war in Europe were being played out in a brutal landscape. And in Russia, Operation Barbarossa had dragged on. Stalin insisted on huge counterattacks that ended with Soviet troops being encircled by the Nazis and the you know, loss of huge numbers of soldiers and territories. And Stalin learned through bitter experience to listen to his generals. So Stalin became, I think, a better military leader by staying out of it rather more towards the end than, than he had at the beginning. In the grip of a Russian winter was an army which, confident it would succeed quickly, had not been issued with greatcoats or winter boots. Trapped in the open and mutilated by the cold, German soldiers returned from their trial with ears and noses snapped off by frost but then it's even colder, and you start to see the accumulation of these problems. They haven't got enough winter supplies, they still can't get enough forces to the front. There is no more Blitzkrieg, there is no more breaking through the Soviet front. The total number of Germans frozen to death in the first Russian winter was greater than the combined total of British and American combat deaths for the entire war. It's actually not Soviet attrition that is wearing down the panzer groups as much as it is the tyranny of distance in the east. 
Operation Barbarossa had been designed to crush Russia in a series of rapid, daring moves, and it had failed. So German eyes turned to one of Hitler's most respected and experienced generals, Erwin Rommel, battling out the fight for territory in the deserts of North Africa. Hitler's troops were immobile in the frozen depths of the Russian winter, but troops in North Africa under Rommel were turning the tide. Once again, someone noted, we are rommeling ahead. After several months of fierce fighting in North Africa, British forces were in full retreat towards Suez. The crucial port of Tobruk fell, one of the heaviest blows I can recall during the war. Churchill admitted. The British had to stomach the loss of Tobruk, and the Prime Minister had to face a censure motion. The fiery Labour member Aniron Bavan said, the Prime Minister wins debate after debate and loses battle after battle. By the end of July, Churchill had some respite. Rommel's advance had been held and turned back at the first battle of El Alamein in Egypt. And he dug in, refusing pleas that he take the offensive until he was assured of overwhelming superiority in men and material. On the night of October 22nd, the second battle of El Alamein opened with the first really heavy barrage fired by British artillery since 1918. It would result in a crucial victory for the Allies and an important turning point in the North African campaign in the Second World War. But Churchill knew that victory solely on the battlefield could not win the war. He and his allies knew the front line ran through the factories. Before June 1941, the Soviet Union had moved its strategic industries to safety behind the Urals. They shipped 25 million people and set them to working 18-hour days with one day off a month. In one, 8,000 female workers without living quarters lived in holes bored in the ground, and they outproduced the much vaunted German industry in quantity and often in quality. Soviet production was supplemented by the American Lend-Lease Agreement which supplied the Soviet Union goods and some weapons. Our country is going to be what our people have proclaimed it must be, the arsenal of democracy. Roosevelt comes up with this ingenious proposal in 1941 called Lend-Lease. So he says, yeah, we're gonna let these people borrow <laughs> some of our military supplies. And uh, we're not extending credit, we're just lending them these things, and they'll give them back once they don't need them anymore. Under Lend-Lease, the USSR was supplied with more than 35,000 radio stations, 380,000 field telephones, 5,900 radio receivers, 15,000 saws, and 1.6 million kilometers of telephone wire. Roughly 20%, we think, of the Russian war effort was fought on the basis of American goods that were supplied through Lend-Lease, something greater than that in the British case. In the four years from 1942, American industrial production, already the world's largest, doubled. And President Roosevelt was prepared to enforce measures that in peacetime would have been unthinkable. In February 1942, he ordered the minimum work week increased to 48 hours in 32 essential industries. 
Factories began to churn out goods at a rapid rate in enormous quantities. The output of each American aircraft assembly worker was double that of their German counterpart, four times that of their Japanese equivalent. The New Deal did not bring back the good times, but the war did. In my view, the passage of the Lend-Lease Act is a more significant date if we're trying to mark when the United States really puts its weight in the scales in World War II, because it's clear by now when Lend-Lease passes that the United States is putting its weight into the scales on the side of the British and the French. Adolf Hitler, when he got news of the passage of the Lend-Lease Act, said this is tantamount to a declaration of war, which it was. Japan heard this declaration loud and clear. They intended to respond. Before me lay the whole U.S. Pacific Fleet in a formation I would not have dared to dream of. So recalled Commander Mitsuo Fuchida, who led the first wave at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. On that fateful morning, bombs and torpedoes devastated battleship row on the island of Oahu. And only a few hours earlier, and thousands of miles away, 5,000 Japanese troops scrambled up the sandy shore of Kota Baru in British Malaya. The war in the Pacific had begun. Probably the largest globally synchronized series of one-day attacks in the history of mankind. They are attacking targets that stretch from the Indian Ocean to Pearl Harbor and they're all synchronized. I think there's a number of things to which we can point. The Europeans were in no position to defend their colonies against the Japanese armed services. Another reason for Japanese success really does come down to it was done to the minutest detail. And they want to attack Great Britain in Malaysia and seize Singapore, which is the bastion of the southeast of Southeast Asia. They'll seize Hong Kong, through which material is still flowing to Chiang Kai-shek, cut off that line of road. They'll advance into Burma. In December 1941, the Japanese had most of its troops deployed in China. But the colonial empires they were attacking, British, French, and Dutch, had been fatally weakened by the European war against Hitler. Their minds and their resources were elsewhere. Thus, the vast and speedy Japanese conquest of Southeast Asia would be achieved with just 11 divisions of men. After land and air attacks in Malaya and Singapore in early December 1941, Christmas morning saw the Japanese turn their attention to Hong Kong. Their vicious occupation began with butchering the wounded and raping Chinese and British nurses. The British colony surrendered by the afternoon, but the atrocities continued. As real disaster threatened, Churchill wrote to General Archibald Wavell, who was stationed in Singapore. There must at this stage be no thought of saving the troops or sparing the population. The battle must be fought to the bitter end at all costs. Commanders and senior officers should die with their troops. Words of which Hitler would have himself been proud. 
As if to emphasize the common inspiration for such instructions, Churchill added, the whole reputation of our country and our race is involved. That reputation was to be battered, if not destroyed, by the Japanese force under General Yamashita, which was advancing down the Malay Peninsula. Any attack is protected by the jungles of Malaysia that stretch to the north to Thailand. Very few roads, very few railroads, very narrow peninsula. And so Singapore is her strategy. So what she'll do is she'll base the Royal Navy out of Singapore. They'll protect the flanks of the Malaysian peninsula. Or so they hoped. Sir Robert Brooke Popham, commanding British land and air forces in the Asia theater, described Japanese soldiers in condescendingly racist terms, subhuman specimens in dirty gray uniforms. I cannot believe, he said, they would form an intelligent fighting force. Yet, the Japanese systematically made their way down the Malay Peninsula by bike in their dirty gray uniforms, and they did not stop until they had crossed the causeway into Singapore, effectively trapping their enemy. The fighting was fierce but short-lived. The British famously had more men, more supplies than their Japanese counterparts. So it was utterly astounding when, on February 15th, General Arthur Percival surrendered to an invading army less than half its size. From the Japanese perspective, Singapore was for the British as Pearl Harbor was for the Americans. So this was the principal outpost of British power and indeed prestige in Asia and the Pacific. So for the Japanese, well, Singapore was a must. It would signal the end of uh, the British position in Asia and the Pacific. Percival, by name, gaunt appearance and baggy shorts, was almost designed to be a scapegoat. But he could not have possibly understood the city-state's importance to have surrendered after only a few days of battle. Winston Churchill called it the worst disaster and largest capitulation in British history. triumphant Japanese government celebrated by distributing two bottles of beer and a packet of red beans to every family, with for children under 13 assorted cakes and treats. On January 30th, Joseph Goebbels wrote in his diary that the Fuhrer profoundly regrets the heavy losses suffered by the white race in East Asia, but that is not our fault. And the Japanese continued their own version of Blitzkrieg in Southeast Asia. When US General Wainwright surrendered his Philippines command, Japan's war of conquest that had begun with Pearl Harbor was effectively over. They had occupied one-sixth of the Earth's surface in five months. Discouraged but not disheartened, the U.S. naval forces were challenging the Japanese plans for total conquest by way of the Doolittle Raid. The Doolittle Raid had been an American exercise in fist-shaking and retribution for the events at Pearl Harbor. Specially adapted bombers launched from U.S. carriers dropped their bombs on Tokyo before flying on to friendly airfields in China. The U.S. took significant losses and the bombs that fell on Tokyo did little harm. But the insult to the emperor, near whose palace bombs had fallen, could not go unanswered. The Doolittle Raid, which forces the Japanese to realize they haven't defeated the American Navy yet. War in the skies continued in the Pacific, but reached fever pitch in Europe as the Allies turned up the heat. The German city Cologne was chosen by the RAF. This is the night 
and the plan is on. When Hamburg, the original site for attack, was ruled out due to poor weather conditions. That's all. Good luck to you all. Only 23 minutes after the attack had started, Cologne was ablaze from end to end. The damage inflicted was less about explosions and more about the fires they created. And for the poor souls on the ground, the main force of the attack was still to come. Finally, the Allied air campaign over Germany is showing its consequences. The Thousand Bomber Raid on Cologne was intended as a marker by Auric Bomber Command. It was a statement of intent, capacity, and capability. If they could mount a Thousand Bomber Raid in 1942, it showed how serious Bomber Command was and what its capabilities were. It had an effect, but it was the propaganda and the statement which was much more important. The boys certainly seem satisfied with their night's work. Oh, it's certainly give Cologne a good pasting this time, anyway. I looked down over the target, nothing but a sea of fire. And after such a raid, Martha Gross in Darmstadt reported a deathly silence in the town. Not a bird, not a green tree, no people, nothing but corpses. The result was utter annihilation, and 95% of the city center lay in ruins. And without the technology to reliably hit precise targets, the alternative for a bomber command of the Royal Air Force was plain. What they quickly work out is they can't hit anything accurately. Their losses are really heavy, and it doesn't seem to be having much effect. So they have to invest ever more in this campaign to try and solve those problems. Area bombing, or carpet bombing, became official policy. Arthur Harris, the man chiefly associated with the strategy, took over bomber command. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. My answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. He's clearly associated with the policy of area bombing, all the heavy civilian casualties that were caused by British bombing. He thought this was the only effective way you could make bombing work against Germany target urban centers and destroy them, causing such devastation that that place would not be able to function in helping the war effort. Bomber command mortality rates were amongst the highest in the war. 56,000 aircrew lost their lives. But during the bombing of German cities, it is estimated more than 500,000 civilians were killed and three million homes destroyed. Hitler refused to meet representatives of bombed cities, refused to visit the devastation. He was living in denial. He was becoming, in many ways, the absent leader. And this would ultimately have an effect on popular perceptions of him, especially later in the war, when things really began to go very disastrously for the German war effort and the strategic bombing campaign was becoming increasingly destructive in Germany itself. With German cities being flattened, Goebbels wrote, the Fuhrer expresses his unshakable conviction that the Reich will one day rule all of Europe. We will have to survive a great many conflicts, but they will doubtless lead to the most glorious triumphs. And from then on, the road to world domination is practically spread out before us. The terror being rained down on the German people would be reciprocated many, many times over. In 1942, Hitler had a meeting at the Reich Chancellery. Here, according to Goebbels, writing in his diary, Hitler said, the world war is here. The destruction of the Jews must be the inevitable consequence. 
there are these three E's which can be used to characterize Nazi policies against the Jews. That's the emigration, evacuation, extermination. And then once each of them failed, then they kind of radicalize the policies uh, and move to the next stage. At the same time, we have to realize that each one of these stages, not only the extermination part, involved a lot of human suffering, a lot of violence, a lot of dispossession of the Jews and uh, uprooting of the Jews. Eight days later, there was a meeting in Berlin. The purpose of the meeting, whose minutes survived the war, was to devise a global solution to Hitler's Jewish question. The Nazi final solution effectively passed a death sentence on 11 million people, none of whom stood accused of any crime. The killing itself starts first in the, in the Soviet Union, uh, not in the gas chambers, but by shooting. Over one million Jews are killed before the decision to build death camps is taken uh, by shooting from uh, close range. So. Really, the Holocaust is not only about Auschwitz. Auschwitz is the ultimate example of, of the industrialized killing of, of the Holocaust. But it started a uh, few years before that in small villages of Ukraine, Lithuania, Belarus, with this very brutal, intimate violence by Germans, by Ukrainians, Lithuanians, and others. In June 1942, at Belgitz, and in July at Sobibor, existing facilities were enlarged. A thousand at a time could now be gassed at Belgitz. At Sobibor, the capacity had been doubled from six to 1,200. On July 23rd, a new camp was opened that would kill more people than any camp except Auschwitz. It was called Treblinka. and it was one of the many death camps now littered throughout Eastern Europe. So this is how the line from persecution to extermination or mass murder is crossed. I would say if we go from west to the east, the um, kind of nature of, of brutalities and terror kept increasing. More to the east, the more brutal the occupation policies. This expansion followed Himmler's order that the resettlement of the entire Jewish population of the general government had to be carried out and completed by the 31st of December 1942. But no Jews were actually being resettled. And another ethnic group was chosen for a similar fate. Between a quarter and half a million Roma are believed to have perished in what the Roma refer to as the Prajmas, or the destruction which is their term for the Nazi genocide directed at them. Those not marked for murder lived in fear of being pressed as slave labor. Between April and November, over 1.3 million civilian workers were sent from occupied Soviet territories to work in the Reich. They were joined by 291,756 from the Polish general government and 357,940 from the occupied territories of Western Europe. A key turning point of that is the Germans, first they say, come and work in German factories. When that doesn't produce enough French, the Vichy regime is forced to introduce compulsory labor conscription called the STO, the Service du Travail Obligatoire, the Obligatory Labor Service. And that starts to really impact on the French. You could kind of ignore the occupation. All oh, right, it's hard to get food, was cut off from your family, but at least the life went on. The STO basically says you have to go and work in German factories. By the end of July, over five million foreign workers were in Germany. Many were literally kidnapped from villages, out of churches and off city streets to labor as slaves in atrocious conditions. Almost two and a half million Osterbeiter are calculated to have died in Nazi hands, a figure which does not include Soviet prisoners of war. The misery in Europe was matched by the hardships in Asia as the war in the Pacific became ground zero for death and destruction. 
6 a.m. on June 4th, Pilot Lieutenant Howard B. Adey of the United States Navy reported two carriers, two battleships, bearing 320 degrees, distance 180 miles, course 135 degrees, speed 25 knots. He had sighted a Japanese task force making for Midway. The attack on Midway itself was not just to occupy the island and use it as a base, it was an incentive to force the US Navy out to fight. So instead of going against Midway with six big carriers, now Yamamoto will only go against Midway with four big carriers. The Japanese make the error of thinking they've sunk three aircraft carriers instead of one. The battle turned on the few minutes in which Commander Wade McCluskey and his 37 dauntless dive bombers off the USS Enterprise fell in at a 75-degree dive at 280 knots. Only one Japanese carrier survived. The Japanese plan was, again, complex, multivariant, all over the place but it relied on the Americans doing what they thought the Americans should do. The Americans played their own game and won. The news of Midway was passed to Prime Minister Tojo with typically obtuse, truth-bending words. The Navy, he was told by General Moritake Tanabe, has made a great mistake. From that point, what happens is all of those fine-grained operational plans that the Japanese Navy officers have been working on for, for decades, all of that's gone. On January 7th, the USS Pollock had sunk a Japanese freighter off Tokyo, the first of the 1,113 merchant ships and 201 warships American submariners would sink in the Pacific War. Japan, a country that depended on shipping for domestic supply, as well as trade and supporting troops, was an early candidate for starvation. The Japanese were now forced to fight the type of war for which it was least suited, a defensive war of attrition. It had made almost no provision for such a war. Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands is the first of a series of island names inscribed indelibly in American history. Kwajalein, Tarawa, Saipan, Guam, Luzon, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. The campaign at Guadalcanal was interesting and important for the rest of the Pacific War because it showed what not to do in the war. What the Americans learned, and the Japanese didn't learn, was that this is not the type of war that is going to be fought if they want to win in the Pacific. For every American serviceman in the Pacific, there were four tons of supplies. For each Japanese, there was one kilogram. They had no maintenance people to maintain them or supplies to maintain them. They couldn't support themselves as isolated garrisons. At every stage and in almost every place, Japan lost more soldiers to sickness and hunger than to enemy action. The people are in dire straits. There's no Japanese industry left. Now, of course, Japan's been cut off from all of its colonies and its empire. So all of a sudden, that really basic food stuff, soybeans, and Japan has lost all access to those soybeans. The people are literally on the verge of starvation. While starving, their homeland was yet to suffer the devastation that was engulfing Europe as Hitler pushed deeper into Russia for his ideological war.
April 5, 1942, Hitler issued Directive No. 41 for Operation Blue, finally, to destroy any remaining military power of the Soviets. More and more, Hitler's discussion becomes less about economic resources and the destruction of the Soviet Red Army. That is assumed, and more and more, it becomes an ideological war. A year after Barbarossa, Germany launched Blue One, targeting Voronezh. The Red Army in the south collapsed, Axis formations flooding the area from Voronezh to Rostov-on-Don. On July 23rd, Rostov-on-Don was back in German hands. The confidence that this generated encouraged Hitler to divide his forces. Army Group A would drive south on the Caucasus oil fields. Army Group B would drive east to Stalingrad. When Hitler issued the directive, Franz Holder, chief of staff of the Army High Command, wrote in his diary that the order was both ludicrous and dangerous. On August 23rd, the 6th Army reached the Volga, north of Stalingrad. Its orders were to smash the enemy forces there. They advanced to the outer suburbs, and a plan was hatched for a final push into Stalingrad, with the Luftwaffe to support the army from the skies. The plan approved. The attack went in at 6.30 a.m. on September 14th. By noon, Axis troops had reached the city center. By early afternoon, Soviet Chukov had been driven from his HQ, and the attackers had reached the Volga. By the end of September, nine-tenths of Stalingrad was in German hands. But it was not enough. During the Battle of Stalingrad, the Germans were not as strong anymore as they had been one year earlier. So when we look at the start of the offensive, the Germans could only deploy one army group against Stalingrad and launch this big offensive, whilst one year earlier in summer 1941, they could deploy or launch their offensive with three large army groups. So only parts of the German army in 1942 could attack Stalingrad. Stone had not resisted the assault, Chukov said, but men did. On November 19th, Operation Uranus, the Stalingrad counterattack, which began with a monstrous bombardment in thick fog and driving snow, went down in Soviet history. November 19th, now celebrated as Artillery Day. It was a stunning defeat of the once powerful German army. Paulus's 275,000 men were trapped. We have to remember it is not just the 6th Army that is encircled. There are parts of the 4th Panzer Army, there are Romanian forces that are encircled there. It is something like a quarter of a million men. There are men starving to death. There are men freezing to death and they are trying to hold a very large area without enough ammunition. Operation Uranus is very successful, and it ultimately will lead to the destruction, the single biggest destruction of German forces until that time. With disaster on the Eastern Front, eyes turned to North Africa and on to Rommel once more. With the Allied and Axis forces skirmishing across North Africa for over a year, the Allies needed a new game plan. The decision had been taken that it would have not been possible to launch a cross-channel invasion, so the decision was taken instead to land in French Northwest Africa. This was Operation Torch that went in in the November of 1942. Rommel ordered the withdrawal of his troops on November 4th, after a week and a half of bitter attritional fighting. Almost a quarter of the German 8th Army's infantry was either killed or wounded. 
when the Allied torch landings hit the beaches at the other end of the North African littoral, the Germans transferred aircraft to meet it. Fighting in North Africa would intensify, moving from Libya to Egypt, Tunisia and Algeria. When the last elements of the Axis forces in Africa surrendered at Cape Bon in 1943, 275,000 German and Italian troops passed into Allied captivity. It was a setback for Hitler. It was a catastrophe for Mussolini. And Mussolini's problems were only going to get worse. In January 1943, the Allied leaders met in Casablanca to talk, in the hope that, unlike their predecessors at Versailles, they would be ready for peace when it finally broke out. The Allies decided that their securing of North Africa would be followed by an invasion of Sicily. This would be to draw German strength to the Mediterranean, to support the Soviet Union and to weaken the German position in Western Europe, but it would also enable the Allies to secure the Mediterranean sea lanes and it would also enable the Allies to maintain offensive pressure during 1943 against the Axis. The invasion of Italy had been the desire of Churchill, but Roosevelt eyed the end prize. At the same time, Roosevelt also announced more or less unilaterally that he would accept only unconditional surrender. And this is where the unconditional surrender doctrine becomes the regnant doctrine of American strategy going forward. Roosevelt had completely benched diplomacy at this stage. Now, only force could settle this war. But in my view, Roosevelt announced the unconditional surrender doctrine as a companion piece to his accession or agreement to the invasion of Italy. He was trying to reassure the Russians that the Americans were gonna stay in the war to the finish. They weren't gonna do what some Americans dismissed as periphery picking that is just needling the Germans around the periphery of Europe and North Africa and Italy, that they were really in it to the final battle and that they were gonna stick with the Russians to the end. On January 22, 1943, Hitler would not hear any talk of surrender and insisted the Sixth Army fight to the last man and the last bullet. Hitler even promoted Paulus to field marshal. No German field marshal had ever surrendered his command, but field marshal Paulus surrendered the following day. The catastrophe at Stalingrad was due largely to Hitler's reluctance to allow the German Sixth Army to break out. And this was typical for Hitler at this point in the sense that he had come to always insist on nonstop offensives and no retreat. And in this case, the result was a disaster. An entire German army, the Sixth German Army, was routed and 100,000 German soldiers were taken captive by the by the Red Army. Despite this disastrous loss, Hitler still controlled more than 2,200,000 square kilometers of Soviet land and ruled over the 65 million people who lived there. Hitler had not crushed the Soviets as planned, but he would not give up. By the summer of 43, new battle lines were drawn and the Battle of Kursk was about to begin. It's a reasonably large-scale operation for the Germans. They involve about 900,000 men and about 2,700 tanks, 5,000 pieces of artillery. But they're actually operating at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the Soviets. The Soviets have some 1.8 million men concentrated in and around that bulge. They have twice the number of tanks and twice the number of artillery pieces. On July 4th, Hitler sent a message to his troops. This day, it said, 
you are to take part in an offensive of such importance that the whole future of the war may depend on its outcome. In this instance, Hitler would prove to be clairvoyant. Marshal Georgi Zhukov, the most important Russian general of World War II, said that the opening bombardment of the Battle of Kursk sounded like the strains of a symphony from hell. Massive tank armies clashed without reaching a decisive conclusion. What does Hitler seek to achieve here? They've actually already owned Kursk earlier in the war. It's not strategically important. Kursk is just an operational opportunity. And in context of a much wider war that Germany is fighting in the Mediterranean, in the skies of Europe, in the Atlantic, one has to ask the question, what is the strategy for the Germans in 1943? They never come up with one. Hitler terminated the operation on the 13th, but the Soviet counteroffensive continued until August 23rd, by which time the Red Army stood on a line from which it could drive west for the Dnieper. The Germans lost between 1941 and 44 about 2,000 men per day permanently. So either they were killed in action or being taken prisoner by the Soviets. This also meant that the quality of the German soldiers and its officer corps was not as good as it was three years earlier. But even into 1944, and you can even ask the question in 1945, what is the German strategy? The problem is, in National Socialism, there doesn't have to be. It is all or nothing. And there is no prospect of considering a negotiated peace. Therefore, the war becomes an end in itself. 